are doing a basic overview of radio labeling. And like I said, we are covering technetium 99M, labeling with metals and labeling with halogens. And then I have a sh short conclusion, I guess. I hope it's not a confusion. <laughs> so uh, we have to look at chemistry a little bit in this lecture. So um, I will dive into the chemistry. Like I said, we are recording it, so it will be made available online. I guess I will just load it up on my YouTube channel and make it open access for everyone. Um, and then we can have a look at um, the chemical principles behind radio labeling. Um, since these lectures are for nuclear medicine physicians, I'm not going to a like, really advanced level, but it's, I guess, a little bit more advanced than what should be expected of nuclear medicine physicians. So I will also highlight some uh, principles that you can study for the test so that you don't feel overwhelmed by all the chemistry. Some of this chemistry took me a really long time to understand. My research is in technetium and rhenium chemistry, and honestly, I'm still learning every day somewhat more about the chemistry behind all of these. So I try to keep it simple and um, easy to explain. My problem with technetium chemistry is that it's really simple when you are in the clinic. So you can take out a kit from the shelf and you can throw in your protechnitate and you label and then it works and you go on. But if it doesn't work, then it's quite uh, tricky to sort out what's going on. Or even if you do research, it's really very uh, elegant and complex chemistry. And I think we underestimate poor technetium quite a lot. Whereas your gallium and your metal radiochemistry, it's a bit easier to explain and also easier to um, do research in to make a new compound. But it's very tricky in the clinic. So sometimes in the clinic, the, the um, metal chemistry just keeps on failing and you also have to understand what that could be. So you should never under, uh, you should have a bit of knowledge about chemistry if you want to work with these radionuclides. I think that's the bottom line. So let's continue. So firstly, we are going to talk about technetium and Keep in mind that rhenium chemistry has some similarities. So these two are kind of outliers in the metals that you can use for radio labeling. Um, they are not exactly the same. And, and that's why we do so much research on rhenium currently, because we would really like to do a therapeutic radio pharmaceutical also from a generator system. The generators, like I said last week, are, are quite similar. Um, but the chemistry is the same, but also not. So it's like me and my sister, we're from the same family. We have the same ideas and background and, and whatever, but you sh you cannot underestimate. Maybe if you um, ask us the same question, we will not always give the same answer. And that's basically how technetium and rhenium chemistry works. So technetium, um, I have to go into some uh, electrons. And remember, this is electrons, so this has nothing to do with the nuclear properties. So I think very early on, let's get the laser pointed sorted. So we are not focusing on this nuclear part, which gives the radioactive or, or decay properties. We are fo focusing now on the electrons on the outside. And these are the ones that you use for chemistry. So you use this part for chemistry, and then in the nucleus, you have the nuclear um, effects. So technetium has an outer shell that contains um, seven electrons, which it easily loses to go into the plus seven oxidation state. So it really wants to look like krypton. So if you go back to your periodic table, you will see here is technetium, and it would really like to use all of, lose all of those electrons to go to krypton because in nature, everything wants to be more stable or have less, uh, well, do less effort. So the noble gases are like lazy chemicals. They don't want to react with everything and they just are there. So technetium would ideally also be lazy. So it will easily lose those seven electrons to go to the plus seven oxidation state. And this is really how you get it out of the generator. So the most stable state of technetium is per technetate, and it's in the plus seven state. So if you look at the molecule, it's a plus seven technetium with a minus four uh, 
um, uh, oxygen, four oxygens, which comes to minus eight, and that's why the molecule is also charged with a minus, and that's how it gets put on this column, or, you know, the uh, molybdenum is minus two on the column, like we talked last week, so the minus one of the technetium after the decay, it's very nice, it comes easily off the column. Okay, so I'm saying a lot of things now. I think important to remember is that it has an outer electron shell that readily loses seven electrons to become the stable protagnitate, which you can elute out of the generator in your saline. And this is really how you get it out of the generator. It's stable in water. It's not really radio, uh, very active. It's radioactive, but it's not chemically active. And you cannot really do anything with it. Um, unless you manipulate it further. And in this case, um, you will be able to use it in, in, in nuclear medicine procedures. Um, so first you have to understand how the biodistribution of the element itself is in the body. So it is in the body if you inject it or, or inhale it or anything like as protectinitate. So it always has this um, association with the oxygen. And um, its biodistribution is similar to iodine um, and chlorine um, ions because it um, can, yeah, it has the same radius as well as the same chemical, um, the minus charge. So it is falsely diffused to the interstitial space and have some slower uptake by different organs. And those are mostly, of course, the stomach or the gastrointestinal tract. So it can be secreted, secreted by mucous cells as similarly to iodine minus. And then also it can be an analog to hydrochloride secretion. And there is a little um, yeah, figure of how that looks. Um, so it's secreted as hydrochloric acid will be and behaves the same in the body. And that's why it is in the gastrointestinal tract. The other area that you would often see is like iodine, where it's a negative charge and it um, gets uh, taken up by the salivary glands as well as the um, thyroid. And that it's also important to remember that it is like iodine but it doesn't act like iodine because it's not the same element. So it doesn't undergo oxidation and organification. Okay. So it's via that active transport method we talked about last time. The sodium iodide symporter will also take up particulate because it cannot see the difference, but it doesn't go into further um, metabolism in the thyroid. So this is how particulate looks. But this is not what, how we want to use technetium. This is not the only way we want to use the protectinitate. So now we have to do different things in order to make it chemically active so that we then can do other procedures. And in this case, I put a picture of system maybe there. Um, and this is the molecule or the only molecule I will basically discuss today for technetium labeling, just as an example. And then it can go to different areas and it has a whole different um, whole body distribution. So if you label in the clinic and you do your particulate and you convert it to maybe and you do your scan and you didn't do any quality control, which I strongly say never do that. But anyway, you haven't done your ITLC, so you don't know your labeling efficiency, but you suddenly see a lot of gastrointestinal tract and thyroid, and it looks more like this instead of the whole body distribution that you would expect for system. Maybe I know often for system, maybe, maybe it's not the best example because we just look at the heart only and we've, focus on that view, but your whole body kind of can give you also an indication of how pure your compound was. Now, the absolute worst thing is to have, say, uh, a, a series of patients that was getting um, bone metabolism agents like MDP, and then you suddenly see a lot of these pictures and you see no bone uptake. And as a pharmacist or technician, you don't want to be 
in that situation where you have to go then say, oh, you know what, the labeling went wrong and our patient is indeed the surrogate for quality control because we can see on the images that it's not good. However, I also strongly recommend if you are the technician in charge or the pharmacist that you go regularly for your patient scans, go see what is the outcomes and see if you can spot any um, deviancies of, of what you expected and also do quality control after the fact that we will in essence call quality assurance. So usually it's good to also see the scans after it and not just, you know, assume everything is going well. There are sometimes subtle differences that you can pick up. So back to the electrons of um, technetium. So we have lost the um, yeah, we have we will lose this outer shell electrons, like we said, for protectinite to become krypton. And now we have to put those electrons back if we want to be able to use this technetium. I told you that um, technetium is now in a lazy state. It looks like a noble gas. It will not help us any any way with the chemistry. So we have to put some electrons back. And that's why we have tin chloride or stannous chloride is the other name or any other um, reducing agent in the technetium kits. These are primed specifically at the right concentrations so that the chemistry works. So you have an optimum amount of this reducing agent that will make sure that your technetium is at the state that it's active. So stannous chloride is a really nice element. It loves to give away electrons. It really likes it. So it will give two electrons to another element. And based on the amount of the stannous chloride in your mixture, you will reactivate the technetium. So let's just recap again. I'm going to repeat myself quite often. You get technetium in its normal state, but it loses all of its outer shell electrons to become protectinite. That is the stable radio nuclide, or uh, sorry, not stable, so <laughs> stable element that you get out of the generator and now we want to reactivate it by adding more electrons from your reducing agent okay so again it's now stable we add some more electrons by your reducing agent um, which is your stannous chloride so in this case you can see that there was seven electrons lost and now i'm adding back six with my stannous chloride. And now there is some spaces to fill for the outer shell. I want to fill the 4D and 5S to become stable again. Um, and that we do by adding your ligands. In this case, it is Cestamibi, which has these um, six ligands to add. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six ligands are added and they contribute to fill this outer shell. And now you can see all of these are nicely filled. So just to recap, we had nothing because it is in its um, stable element form coming out of the generator. We add electrons by your reducing agent tin. And then your molecule that you add to your mixture to label your vector, in this case system maybe, is adding more electrons to make it stable. So it's both the molecule and your stannous chloride that contributes to make all of these electrons in the outer shell full. And then you have a stable molecule that you can inject into your patient. So how does it look in the radiopharmacy? This is a very important figure that I like to ask because it says a lot. It says what's, what goes on with your labeling um, mechanism and what can go wrong. So you have your protectinate eluid that comes in your coordination state of seven, which is your um, not so useful form. You reduce it with tin to add more electrons. And then your reduced form in this case has a coordination state of one. And you can add all of your six um, system maybe uh, ligands and you get your technetium system maybe. If you add more air to the mixture, so if uh, the person drawing up the doses is uncareful and they add some oxygen while they um, take up the dose, it removes some of the um, 
the tin in the, the mixture. So there's always an excess um, just to keep the molecule a bit more stable. And that is then um, the oxygen that's introduced removes some of these extra electrons that the tin would like to give. And it moves the technician back to this coordination state seven. And then when you inject it into your patient, you will see free protectinate. So all the things that can be harmful for this um, mixture that will lead in free protectinate is if there is too little tin in the kit due to the manufacturer. This is a failure to reduce, add those electrons that you need for the labeling. If there is technetium 99 because you didn't elute your generator in the last 24 hours and there was a buildup of this technetium 99, it's the same element as technetium 99M and will chemically react the same, so it will also use up your tin or if your tin is reduced by air introduced during the procedure. Just as a side note, water is not good for this um, as well. So water forms tin hydroxide colloids. It's also something that we use um, as a radio pharmaceutical, by the way. These tin colloids, so it re water reacts with this tin, forms colloids, little particles, and then this technetium 99M likes to stick on these particles and then form colloids. So that's also something we don't want. So very important, the stability of the oxidation state of the chemical here at the end depends on the environment, so the amount of air and the tin. So actually it's about the tin in this mixture, as well as the type of ligand. Some are more stable than others. Really important to know, this is the oxidation state. So this is what oxidation state we want here in the end for labeling to take place with the molecule. In this one, I said system maybe, so it would be coordination state one, as you can see here down below. And then protectinate is in coordination state plus seven, as we discussed, the one that's not really that active. So this is an important um, table just to know with which radio pharmaceuticals in the clinic you will struggle and with which you can easily label. It also ties into the question, say you have maybe an older generator or a generator that has not been eluted the past 24 hours, this technetium 99 builds up. Which one could you still label and maybe have a successful labeling and which one should you stay away? Which of these kits are more susceptible to the amount of tin and which of them are not? So the really stable form, um, forms are technetium plus seven, as we discussed, as well as technetium plus four. So technetium plus four is also another state that technetium likes to take on really relatively easily compared to the others. So by preference plus seven and then plus four and then the rest comes. So if you are working and labeling on a regular basis, you will see here that the ones that you often struggle to label with is actually plus five or maybe plus three and plus one. So those are the states that you really have to fine tune the available reducing agent and um, to make sure that the reaction um, is complete and actually happens or the radio pharmaceutical is stable. So it comes to you as no surprise that in technician plus five, you have candidates like HMPAO and MAG3 and tetraphosphamine. And then also at plus one is system maybe, and sometimes DMSA also, depending, might give you some issues, whereas you rarely see MDP or DTPA or pyrophosphate fail in the clinic. So this is why. And that's why I say it's important to understand the chemistry. So just to highlight again, the technetium 99 compound is stabilized by <clears throat> the tin in your mixture. And the ligand. So this is the one leg of the MIBI. So it's not system MIBI, this is just MIBI. <laughs> and it forms system MIBI with um, technetium then in the middle. And it's a mixture of the tin amount as well as the ligand that finally stabilize your molecule in the correct geometry as well as um, charge and all of those nice things. <clears throat> 
and um, the contents of a technician kit, of course, is your reducing agent and your ligand. You have a buffer to adjust the pH as well as a stabling agent. So this can be antioxidants and so forth. And then you freeze dry it and then in the end you use it in the clinic. Really elegant system, fine tuned to perfection. You really have problems in the clinic and it's just really easy to use. Your QC, um, I'm not going to go too much in depth because there will be another lecture on quality control, but you um, spot your radiopharmaceutical on your instant fin layer tomography, oh, ITLC, instant fin layer chromatography strip, and then you can develop it in acetone and saline. That's normally the most often used systems for protectinitate uh, based radiopharmaceuticals. Your protectinitate goes to the front in in acetone as well as saline, your colloids stay at the bottom and your area pharmaceutical, depending, will be um, split between the two and then you can calculate the amount of radio um, chemical purity you have. Really easy to do, doesn't take a lot of time and I think it's really critical to perform this. Then just as a final um, wider look at how technetium works. So you have your uranium in the reactor, you um, bombard it uh, with neutrons, it splits, you get molybdenum 99 and a lot of other radionuclides. It is isolated, shipped into a capsule, placed into the generator, you elute, and then you can make many radio pharmaceuticals out of this one source, which makes technetium still the most used and amazing radionuclide in my opinion. Okay, great. That was all I wanted to say about technetium because you can go on for hours and days and years. And like I said, I'm still learning more as we go on. But I think that's just the basic knowledge that you should have. So next up, we will go to all the metals. So um, I'm going to use gallium as an example, but it also works for all of these others. So you would see lutetium, actinium, we might just touch on them a little bit. Terbium is now the new up and coming radionuclide. Zirconium used for monoclonal antibodies. Yttrium has been there for many years for therapy. Scandium, very rare, but is also used. Indium have been used quite a lot in the past. Late bismuth, all of these are used in a similar fashion. So this is actually a really large part of nuclear medicine um, going forward. So this is radio metals and it's the transition radio metals that we are looking at as well as the actinides and lanthanides. So again, we have gallium radio um, a metal and this is how it looks when it's not labeled and it's in its gallium citrate form and injected into the patient. But this is not useful for us, maybe one or two um, things that you can image with it and can be of interest like infection or inflammation, but we really want to incorporate it in a radio pharmaceutical and then see some useful images. So this could be the same patient. This is a, a labeling that, for instance, failed or didn't happen. And this is the free radionuclide. And this is one where we coupled it to prostate-specific membrane antigen, a peptide targeting prostate cancer. So you can see how useful it would be to be able to incorporate it in many different molecules. All of these radiometals often is used for peptides. Why? Because peptides are larger molecules and as you can see this part where it, you need um, the molecule part that you need to label the radio metal is quite large. So if you have a small molecule as you would have had with technetium, this um, chelator what we call that traps the radionuclide is too big and that influences the biodistribution of the molecules so substantially that it's not really useful. So you need bigger molecules for the radio metals to be able to follow the molecule and not the labeling part. Okay, so always peptides, monoclonal antibodies, bigger molecules. So the radio pharmaceuticals for metals is, a, um, and here I have a lutetium example, is basically a biological vector that targets a receptor or enzyme. So we no longer image processes like perfusion or um, yeah, maybe bone metabolism or these things. We are more focused on receptors or enzymes. So we are going on molecular level and looking at the disease on molecular scale. 
So you have your radionuclide, which is your radioactivity source. You have something called a chelator, which stands for the word claw. It catches like a claw, it catches the radio metal. So it's a very specifically designed chemical that is a claw that catches your radioactivity. This is coupled through a linker, it's just like a, a chain to your vector that is biologically active. So this is a peptide targeting a receptor. Examples are prostate specific membrane antigen for the PSMA receptor or maybe um, octreotide, which is a peptide-based pharmaceutical out there for neuroendocrine tumors that targets the somatostatin receptor. They put on the linker and the claw, and you can now label it with any radio metal you want, like lutetium, gallium, all of those things. So it can be for therapy or diagnostics, and we go into the concept of pheronostics, which I also have a separate lecture on. So, for instance, you can see the chemistry is much easier in this case. You have a gallium eluid coming from your generator, or you have maybe a radionuclide coming from the reactor or the cyclotron in a plus three state. So it's charge plus three, which is perfect to go into this claw or cavity. So it's just making associations with all of these oxygens and hydroxyl groups and the nitrogen groups on this molecule. It's perfect designed chemistry. So we don't need to worry about the chemistry as much as we do with um, technetium, but there is some few critical aspects. You have a metal in here, so it should be free of any other metals. So we have to always purify our eluids or our sources of radionuclides to make sure that we only have one metal. Because as gallium is a, a metal with a free plus charge, so is iron. Iron. So it's um, Fe free plus. Or you have other metals like zinc and those things, and you have to remove it from your um, source because all of these metals will go into this chelator. These chelators are non-selective for the metals that we use. So all of the metals can actually uh, mess up your labeling. Okay, so that's the one very important thing to remember. We always have to purify the radionuclide source that it's only one metal. You have to label at a certain pH because these metals are only soluble at certain pH ranges. For gallium, it's um, three to five. pH three, maybe a little bit lower, two to five. But if you have a basic solution with your gallium, it's insoluble and it forms colloids. So the wrong pH, metal contamination, all of that can cause um, poor labeling. Then um, you have to also heat up your mixtures for certain chelators. There are modern chelators designed to not cause this, but you have to add some kinetic energy into the reaction to label. So if you do not label for a long enough time or at the right temperature, your labeling will also fail. Very interestingly, after the labeling has been formed, these are extremely stable and you don't have problems in the, uh, when it's injected into the patient with stability. You also have some methods to purify. So this is radio labeling with metals in a nutshell. Okay, so pH is important, like I said. So you have different species. So you can see gallium OH4 minus is colloids. So when your pH of your labeling mixture is um, too high, you will get colloids. Here, the three to seven is normally the range where we try, and then lower, it's also giving you some problems. pH is important. Now here, I just added three radio labeling methods for you that you can have a look at. The first one is gallium, the second one is lutetium, and the last one is actinium. It's just examples that I had um, and added for interest, just to show you if you can label gallium, you can label lutetium, and you can label actinium with DOTA-based chelators. There is also a million other chelators on the market, and each of them have their own characteristics. So when you design a new radio pharmaceutical, give somebody that knows how to a uh, call. But if you have a DOTA FAPI, for instance, fibroblast activating protein targeting radio pharmaceutical, you can label this guy with gallium, lutetium, and actinium. Yeah. 
it's no problem. So you elute your illusion from the generator, in this case, gallium, or you can get it from a cyclotron. You have some purification or concentration process. You add this to a vial, con in this case, um, having PSMA 11 or 4P or whatever, buffer to 4, pH 4. Um, uh, so buffering is the process of um, changing the um, conditions in the vial from acidic to more basic or neutral, but here we have a slightly acidic condition. It has your peptide in and then you add your gallium, you label by incubating for in this case 5 to 10 minutes at room temperature, you can post purify and then you have your final buffering phase to neutral pH and use your QC. This is how very easy the labeling method is. When you label in the clinic, your problems will often be metal contamination from a source. If you use metal needles, if your generator leaks too many metals and you cannot remove everything by pre-purification, if some of the water or acid or stuff that you use have some metal contaminants in, this is all um, things that would influence your labeling with these um, radionuclides. Metal contamination is your biggest enemy. Lutetium, very easy. You add your lutetium, you buffer to five with sodium acetate buffer. You add some radio protection if you want or not, antioxidants. You incubate for 60 minutes, post purify, and you have your lutetium um, radio pharmaceutical. And indeed, actinium that we all hear about at these conferences, everybody's running around about it. I have some strong opinions. But anyway, actinium is also very easy to label. Um, my experience was actinium was, lutetium was the easiest, actinium was still relatively easy. I had more problems with gallium than the other two. Um, and that was because it came from a generator and the generators was always giving us some trouble. So actinium, it sounds amazing. You see all these results, but it's relatively easy to make in the radio pharmacy. You just add it, incubate it, and then you have your radio pharmaceutical you of course always have to do QC. Like I said, you can maybe make a kit. I've made many, um, I've been part of the process to design gallium kits just for PSMA and dotatate labeling. The idea was to make it as easy as technetium. You just, uh, you add buffer, ligand and a stabilizing agent, freeze dry, and now you can add your lutetium, your gallium or your actinium and label a one pot synthesis. There is some ITLC methods for you. Um, if you write the test, I think you should maybe memorize this. It's also very easy methods. Also just spot, run the ITLC strip, and then you just evaluate it. We will definitely have a lecture on quality control in the radio pharmacy. I don't know when I scheduled it. Yes, that's lecture number 19. And then finally, I want to go into the halogens because this lecture wouldn't be complete if I don't touch on fluorine 18, iodine and astatine. I'm going to focus today on fluorine 18, but you all know iodine and MIBG, for instance, and then astatine is also a therapeutic alpha emitter that is out there, very difficult to work with. Uh, as these elements go heavier on this list, the more difficult they are to label. So I'm just going to have three slides on fluorine 18. I'm not the expert, I have to say. My expertise is mostly in um, generator-based systems and metals. I think um, you get two types of radiochemists, the met metallic ones and then the halogen ones. So I am not, but I can tell you the basics. So modern radiochemistry mostly have a nucleophilic fluorination where your nucleophile, um, in this case, your fluorine attacks your molecule and then you have a, a, a leaving group that leaves the molecule and now you have your fluorine incorporated. Okay, so your fluorine attacks your molecule. There is some other um, leaving group that is um, kicked off, if I can say it in that layman's terms, and then your fluorine is there. So it's basically a substitution. There is two options in the modern um, uh, manufacturing um, line. It's either direct labeling where you have your full molecule 
and that's mostly for maybe smaller molecules like FDG or so on, where you have a leaving group. So your fluorine 18 attacks here, the chloride, chloride comes off and your fluorine is incorporated in this molecule and this radiopharmaceutical is complete. Or you have click chemistry where you make a small molecule by this method and then you have a larger molecule and you just combine the two in the end. So because fluorine 18 has a half-life of 110 minutes, the radioactive half-life, you cannot have very long synthesis methods. So you ha will have to have just one step in the end to incorporate your fluorine 18 in the molecule. So either you have an easy leaving group and you finally just replace with fluorine or you have a fluorine 18 compound that you click onto your bigger compound. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So um, I just have here the production method of FDG to show you how that would work. Um, so you have this um, starting molecule and you will see that these um, oxygen groups are protected because we only want the uh, reaction to take place here. So we protect the rest of the molecule. So this is a precursor that you can buy. You first have a very nice leaving group. There's um, sulfur, two oxygens, and uh, a carbon fluoride here. You want this to leave. So your fluorinating attacks here. It um, split off this leaving group that is really happy to go. And then you have a uh, um, fluorinating molecule that looks like FTG, but it still has these protective groups on. You deprotect by a strong base or an acid, and then you finally have your FTG molecule. So it's really a simple method, and it's really well um, designed and thought out and works really well. So I have another synthesis here. It's more um, uh, extreme, but you guys don't need to, to memorize this at all for the exam. So you will have your precursor, um, and then you have the purification of uh, your fluorine 18 that you dry and then um, you add your precursor here. Why did I add it in here? Okay, so you have your fluorine 18 production method here in the beginning. You purify your fluorine 18 on a cartridge so that you make sure you only have fluorine 18 and not other any other um halogens or stuff that can influence your labeling method. You dry your fluorine 18 and purify it further. Then you add your molecule. You will see it has also a protective step. This oxygen group here is also protected. It also has a nice leaving group. So in this one step, you make a fluorinated intermediate by having the um, fluorine substitute this leaving group. It's the same as FTG. And then you add also your acid and then your deprotection take place. And then you have your f miso in this instance. Um, then you have to purify it through multiple steps to make sure you re remove all of these contaminants. Um, some of them are part of the uh, fluorine 18 production process. Some of part of this production method. There is also some uh, uh, harsh solvents that you cannot inject into humans that are not safe. So you have to do a lot of QC um, and then your final formulation is also adjusted to pH for injection and then you go to um, quality control. There's also a nice pharmacopoeia methods for, for all of these four in 18 surfaces. But then also recently in the last few years and also where I work currently, they um, actually decided why don't we make um, fluorine 18 a metal. So this is the last method I want to discuss. You have aluminium and you react it with fluorine 18 and then you get an aluminium fluorine 3 plus molecule. And as we know, 3 plus and chelators works really nice. Um, so then you have this um, metal-like halogen that replaces gallium. So then you label your um, fluorine, uh, your 
gallium compounds that you would usually label with gallium, you can now label with aluminium fluoride. It's a really nice method. It works really well. And here is a, a reference that you can read up on it more. If you ever have a cyclotron, I really suggest you look into this method. So it's really um, easy and it has good yields. And yeah, not going to go into more depth on that. So I think we have made it to the end of the lecture. I thank you for all your patience. Final word is that um, there is three different labeling methods. So yes, the fluorine 18th um, chemistry is very intricate, but these come normally in, in fully automated systems. So you get your aluminum fluoride from the cyclotron. It goes into this fully automated robotic system and you don't really need to do a lot. So um, also very, very little can go wrong and you cannot really uh, tinker or change the chemistry as much. It's just a straightforward robotic um, synthesis process. Whereas with your gallium, um, you can go into semi-automation, automation and kit vials and all of them have pros and cons. So all of these, um, so if you look at the basic technetium labeling, you have a kit, you add your technetium, it's very, um, elegant, the chemistry, and then if you go into the more advanced ones, most often you will find that they actually have automation systems to make it easier in the clinic. But you still need to understand how these work and what is the chemistry behind it. So I hope I gave you some uh, better um, insight into the chemistry. As always, you guys can WhatsApp me, email me with any questions. Um, yeah, and then housekeeping. So there is my email addresses again my personal cell phone number and i'm also on linkedin if you want to get hold of me we have a test in october for 50 marks i will make it like early october so you can join also let me know if you want to join how many of you want to join final test in november 100 marks this is like a mini exam for the registrars and then um, we still have class, another 23 are planned, and the next set of lectures are radiation, safety, and waste management. And then we start into the more pharmacology and clinical things like bone metabolism and cardiology. I hope you found this interesting, and I want to thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you.